This is a brief presentation of the work From Invisibility to Hypervisibility by Karen Leong et al. I will offer a brief, a brief discussion of some of the main points and provide some visual imagery to further represent some of her core arguments. The main objective is to understand why she critiques the visibility gained by Vietnamese Americans after Hurricane Katrina and its implications for environmental justice and racism in the U.S. Before we dive further into the content, I want to make some brief biographical notes. First, we must note that this particular section has multiple authors, seven in fact. So rather than provide biographies, I will only hi highlight only the first author, Karen J. Leong. Throughout the lecture, I will refer to Leong as the author in order to be concise. Leong's work focuses on the racialization of Asian Americans, Asian Americans and gender, and oral history. She has collaborated, collaborated with many of the authors from this sec selection to write multiple chapters and articles about Asian Americans and the aftermath of Katrina. She also works on oral histories of Japanese Americans in Arizona. Karen Leung is an Associate Professor of Women and Gender Studies and Asian Pacific American Studies in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. The rest of this presentation will aim to treat each of the chapter sections for an average of about four minutes, three or four minutes each. This is a listing of the sections within Leung's chapter, which we will treat one at a time. You can review the subtitles here, but I will list them again as we move forward. Leung starts with a quote from Japanese American poet and writer Mitsui Yamada. Yamada's phrase reflects on her own journey through experiences of invisibility and visibility, starting with her family's incarceration in the Minidoka camp in Idaho during World War II. Yet those experiences of in invisibility, like the largely unknown stories of Japanese American women laboring in the prison camps in this photograph, represent a shared experience for Asian Americans. Young uses this phrase to signal the unique ways that Asian American visibility and invisibility operates, and specifically how it again worked during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. In brief, she reminds us that the racial imagination of the U.S. often relegates Asian Americans as an absent presence. Historically, Asian people were either denied entry to the U.S. or legally denied citizenship and rights once they arrived. Today, they continue to be framed as perpetual foreigners or n not really being from here, except in moments where they prove useful as examples of model minorities, which we will return to shortly. Before we continue with Long's analysis, I want to contextualize the city of New Orleans and the events of 2005 with a quick series of images and maps. In terms of geography, New Orleans sits next to a large lake and many other bodies of water and wetlands areas, directly along a set of curves in the Mississippi River as it heads into the Gulf of Mexico. The area we will be spending most of our attention is New Orleans East, and specifically the Village de l'Est district at the top right corner of this map. New Orleans is a segregated city, especially for African Americans. The areas of focus in New Orleans East are and were heavily black and Vietnamese, and relatively equally split. This area has also been high in poverty, with more than 30% of Vietnamese and more than 40% of African Americans falling be below the poverty line. Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast region of the U.S. as a Category 5 causing the usual high winds and heavy rain. In New Orleans, it also helps swell the river and adjacent waters all around the city. While this image exaggerates, exaggerates the scale, it does accurately show how many parts of the city, nearly 50%, are actually built on lands that rest below sea level and lake level. This has long made large areas of the city vulnerable to flooding. As a result, the city relies heavily on natural and human-made levees, or walls and barriers that channel water and buffer against sea rise or water rise. 
in addition to the hurricane damage and water, when those levees broke during the hurricane pressures, the water came through rapidly. In total, the hurricane killed more than 1,800 people along the Gulf Coast, most of those in Louisiana, and left about 80% of New Orleans underwater. More than 1 million people overall were evacuated. In this map, we see how the areas of New Orleans East and the Ninth Ward, another poor and black area, among others, were particularly hard hit with those areas seeing water rising anywhere from six feet to more than 10 feet in depth. The total cost for repairs and damage has been tens of billions of dollars. And this map showing where the victim claims were being filed from also nicely indicates where those who fled the city settled as they waited to return or not. Returning to Leong's chapter, we pick up the story of the Vietnamese and African American district in New Orleans East. In the aftermath, the media focused in on the efforts of the Vietnamese community to successfully return and recover in New Orleans. Initially ignored in the media during the hurricane and evacuation, coverage of the community recovery spread throughout every major network and medium. These feel-good stories shared how the Vietnamese American community rallied, saved lives, and returned ready to begin rebuilding. But these stories, Leong tells us, matter in how we understand the processes, outcomes, and implications of the Hurricane Katrina recovery in cities like New Orleans. Leong argues that during the recovery, Vietnamese American moved from a place of invisibility to one of hypervisibility. In many ways, this proved to be a positive development. Leong asks that we consider a more nuanced perspective on the benefits and dangers, the frames and the critiques of this moment of change in which Vietnamese American community, the Vietnamese American, in which the Vietnamese American community gained momentary presence and recognition. Despite nearly 40% of the Vietnamese residents being linguistically isolated, a number of factors saw them successfully escape the hurricane and return and recover at a faster rate than their neighbors. One of the main sources of organization turned out to be the Queen Mary of Vietnam, Vietnam Church in the Versailles neighborhood, seen here in this image. Pastor Vien Nguyen, in particular, proved invaluable for the community's safety and overall coordination and communication. In contrast, many of the black residents struggled to escape without harm, to access resources, or to recover as quickly. So what was the difference? The ability to explain this difference is, of course, partly a matter of understanding racialization. On this slide, we see two nearly identical stories from New Orleans featuring people trying to survive the disaster. In addition to frequently referring to black citizens as refugees, which is a legal and international category, news media cast the survival techniques in different lights depending on the survivor in question. Appearing on the same day, these images and captions ran through the Associated Press, the single most significant source of shared news across the nation. Here, the verbs are highlighted for your convenience. This kind of unconscious difference making seems incredibly important, of course, since law enforcement were given explicit authority to shoot looters. In light of these media frame, in light of these racial frames of reference, Leong points to the impact of racializations in the media focus on the Vietnamese American success. Leong places such stories within a long history in the U.S. of Asian Americans being granted visibility, mostly in the form of the middleman figure or the model minority. The middleman story represents an entrepreneur who sets up business, for example, in areas not deemed lucrative and yet succeeds. 
we laud him or her for their tenacity even as we do not envy their position we see this for example in the stories about korean liquor store owners in los angeles braving the la uprising following the ronnie king beating verdict here we see a woman michelle ha featured in a 2012 news story on her efforts to protect her shop from city shutdown even though she effectively serves in a violent and highly criminal area in Baltimore, abandoned by other businesses. These stories, however, directly imply as much about those racialized groups not mentioned, white and black, as those they feature, usually Asian. The model minority store is another common symbol used to differentiate groups that seem more capable of social and economic success. Most importantly, Asian American visibility is called upon precisely and almost exclusively when needed to outright explain or indirectly suggest why some groups struggle, all while avoiding any need to address systems of racial disadvantage or advantage. Asian successes are used to chastise other non-white peoples, often without adequate context for that success. Leon tells us that, quote, as model minorities who, according to the social narrative, work harder and thus are more likely to succeed than other non riot groups, and as immigrant entrepreneurs who are accused of profiting from urban poverty, Asian Americans are rendered visible at, at specific moments to obscure the system of whiteness, the system of racism at work." Unquote. The formula is simple. If Asians succeed, then racism must not be a real barrier. If there are no real barriers, then when other groups do not succeed, the fault must be their own. The momentum of recovery and media recognition, however, centered around the opening of a landfill outside of zoning regulations for dumping household debris. A multi-ethnic coalition and resistance by community members concerned about their small farms and overall water contamination, including that of a nearby wetland preserve, generated widespread support. By gathering national interest, the coalition put enough pressure on the city that the mayor was forced to rescind the order and shut it down. In the final section, Leong lays out the different kind, the kinds of resources that allowed the Vietnamese in New Orleans, who seem like they should have no capacity for success as refugees, to nonetheless succeed in numerous ways. One of the most important to consider, she notes, is the value of hidden but powerful community capital. Despite the common narrative, she notes, most Asian, Asian immigrants to the U.S. arrive with a good deal of social, educational, and economic capital. This is partly by design. U.S. immigration laws and policies stretching back for decades prioritize those with desirable skills and backgrounds. This actually begins precisely at the moment when Asian were no longer racially excluded from entering the country seeking citizenship in the 1960s. Not all of the Vietnamese immigrants that came to New Orleans as refugees, of course, had some of those favored skills. They did, however, benefit from a number of important, but usually overlooked sources of community capital. capital. Despite of, and sometimes precisely because of their experiences as war refugees. Even before their arrival, many of the Vietnamese in New Orleans community members had clear social and economic networks and collaborations in place. The Catholic Church, for example, led their escape from Vietnam. Most of the residents there also came from the same villages, so they had built strong built-in connections. Further, they had recently together survived the ravages of war and terrible escape from their home country. This even allowed some to see the hurricane in comparison to be simply a minor, minor convenience given they had just survived a brutal war, refugee camps, and relocation to a strange new country. The Vietnamese refugees received some U U.S. support as previous allies of the government during the war. Nationally, they were also firmly linked to numerous Vietnamese and Asian American organizations with political and economic leverage and resources, all of which showed up to support this relatively small group during and after the hurricane. 
While African Americans face numerous barriers in the recovery process and usually receive far fewer resources during evacuation and in the reconstruction efforts, Vietnamese American successes after Katrina were assumed and implicitly designated as resulting simply from their inherent cultural values, hard work, family cohesiveness, and or other educational um, or, and or other achievements. In short, the features of the model minority. Yet in the end, their success came from several elements of community capital. On the community level, this particular group built on numerous strengths of surviving as refugees in the U.S. On the larger scale, they were able to tap into national environmental justice alliances, utilize activist and scientist support, and work through a cross-class and multi-ethnic collaboration within their neighborhood. So while their story is one of success and visibility, Liang tells us, not all visibility is equal, and clearly not all vision focuses on the same things.